sure. I'm excited to try something, to try an experiment, just to, to see how we can use this space better. Getting cars off the street is really what the city needs. Let's make New York a pedestrian city. Uh, we are standing in Little Prince Plaza. It's a new uh, demonstration plaza here in Soho, New York City. And we're going to be testing this out for the next four Saturdays. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. This is episode number 97, and I'm excited to welcome Mike Leighton, co-founder of Street Plans, back onto the podcast for a quick chat about some of the amazing plaza projects and street transformations he and his firm have been involved with over the past 18 months. We also discussed some of the powerful changes he witnessed this past summer while traveling in Bordeaux and Paris. But before we roll into those discussions, please allow me a brief moment to say that this episode is being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Thank you so much, folks. I simply couldn't do this without your support. If you too are in a position to make a donation and would be willing to do so, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. It's also important to mention that there are a few other ways that you can really help support my efforts. The first is to simply subscribe to the audio podcast on your preferred listening platform. Next is to subscribe to the Active Towns YouTube channel. Just be sure to click on that bell next to the subscribe button so that you get an alert when I post a new video each week. And finally, please help me to spread the word about the Active Towns initiative and my content by sharing it with anyone you think might benefit. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get rolling with my conversation with Mike Leiden. Well, hey, Mike Leiden, it's so wonderful to have you back on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks, John. It's great to be back. It's good to see you digitally again. <laughs> exactly, exactly. One of these days we're actually going to get together again in person. Um, I feel like we're in a little bit of uh, uh, seeing you Congress withdrawal because that's usually when I see you in person. I was going to say this has been our longest gap since maybe 2013 or 14, perhaps, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to exactly. see each other yeah. in real life. So yeah. yeah, we're due for a run. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So, and speaking of which, um, I was like looking back to when our last conversation was, and it was 18 months ago. So uh, to say that the world has, has changed yet again would be an understatement. Sure. Uh, what have you been up to in the last 18 months? <laughs> uh, it's a blur to be honest. We've been extremely busy, um, at the firm doing a range of really exciting projects. Um, some of which would have likely happened, you know, anyways, without the pandemic and some that have very much been in response to that and, and cities and communities seizing opportunities to, you know, create livelier, safer, better streets. And so we've been very engaged with that. And then personally, uh, we've had a, a, another child. So that's kept me plenty busy at home with a three and a half year old and an eight month old baby, um, which is super exciting. So we're, we're, um, you know, we're busy at both ends, my wife and I. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And it, what was interesting too, is that, so we, it was literally 18 months ago. So it was in April when we, uh, uh published the, the podcast, uh, from the first time. And I, I was amused by some of the things that we were talking about in the sense that at that stage, we still didn't really know much about how, uh, the virus spread. So, you know, we were talking a lot about, uh, you know, the apprehension of pressing push buttons at, at, at crosswalks and things of that nature. We, we didn't know as much about, you know, the, con, you know, whether the uh, contagion, the, the virus, you know, could be spread as easily with touch. We, we now know a little bit more about that. We know that it's primarily a, an airborne and respiratory, uh, type of, 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 uh, of virus spread and pandemic. Um, but it was very interesting too to see that even at that early stage, even in April of last year, we were seeing the um, 
the 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 shift the paradigm shift over street space um i get the sense that it it just got even more it, it just kept, that snowball just kept rolling talk a little bit about that because i i get the sense that you are right at the pointy edge of of you know that movement to to redefine and recreate what our streets are for yeah, you, you could see it, right? You could see that, um, you know, yeah, you're right. We didn't know how long this is going to last. We didn't know all the details of transmission, but you could see that once the ball started to roll with um, cities, not just in the U.S., but around the globe, starting to take different measures um, to rethink and reallocate space um, in their streets, that uh, there was going to be a lot of that activity. And I think that's what's really interesting about how ideas and best practices spread is that it's very much these patterns get developed and cities play catch up with each other and um and everyone kind of thinks through what how can they allocate resources to respond to a crisis right and that's exactly what many cities did um around the globe and have continued to do and it's been interesting to see some which have doubled down on those changes and are investing in those changes some are very much you know keeping things uh in in play but not necessarily committing to long-term rethinking of streets and public spaces. And then other cities have reverted back in a number of ways to, you know, to pre-pandemic life. Um, so there's definitely like those three buckets that are out there. And it's been interesting to be in New York because I'd put us somewhere in between the keeping things in place, but not quite yet marshalling the resources to fully, um, you know, seize this moment of, Hey, let's, let's take these things we've learned and let's put, more intensive resources behind and accelerate them. And I think that's really, you know, where I am locally, that's a really big opportunity that will hopefully come into um, focus when the new mayoral administration here in New York City um, gets into office on January 1. Right, yeah. Now, I, I also noted that uh, at that stage uh, in April of 2020, uh, you were helping uh, sort of capture and document a lot of uh, the the activities that were out there, sort of like a database. Uh, I, I get the sense that you probably got really busy doing <laughs> work, and yes. but I, you know, was that sort of the that process of being able to collect that? That was that on autopilot? Are people still uh, putting information into that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I started to build a database of all these changes and organized it typologically. Um, to what different um, interventions that cities were doing. And, you know, I certainly wasn't the only one who did that. And there was maybe three or four other people that started roughly around the same time uh, keeping track of this. And so I got to the point where I couldn't keep up with it. And this was, you know, I started that in April, or maybe it was actually late March I started that. And then by, um, by yeah, middle of June, I just couldn't keep up with the changes and track it. And so wound up very happily giving over the spreadsheet control to um, a couple other folks who were basically stitching all the different databases together to keep track of the changes that were made during that period. And I think um, what they are actively doing now is kind of analyzing the results of all that work. You know, what has moved on to be permanent? What lessons have we learned? Who's reverted back to pre-pandemic? And so, um, so that's, yeah, that's in someone else's hands, but really it was, happy to contribute I, you know saw the need for it and thought you know this is something that is going to be a transformational shift and we be, need to be able to share those best practices so i know that many 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 people around the globe you know were accessing that spreadsheet and at any one it's a google sheet right so you could see who was on it or how many people were using it at the time and there would be you know oftentimes hundreds of people on that spreadsheet at the same time um kind of through mid to late spring of, of 2020. So it was great to be able to contribute that and, you know, proud that people have taken that work and continue to, to dive into it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, I, I think what, we'll, what, what would be fun to do is, you know, for our audience here is uh, to, to give a little bit of a visual of what it is you've been up to. So <laughs> Clarence with Street Films uh, sent over a link uh, for a recent film that he shot, uh, you know, of, of one of your projects. So I won't introduce it at all. I'm, I'm just going to hit play and uh, it's not very long. So we can, I think it's pretty self-evident what this is all about. So uh, if uh, the technology uh, 
uh, overlords are with us here and uh, we're able to, to make this happen, uh, we, we should have a video coming up here in just a moment. Austrian city. Uh, we are standing in Little Prince Plaza. It's a new uh, demonstration plaza here in Soho, New York City. And we're going to be testing this out for the next four Saturdays to communicate to folks in the neighborhood that there's a possibility of reclaiming even more space for the public, for walking, for sitting, and for enjoying the beautiful architecture. And we want people to be able to see it, to walk in it, to sit in it, and really understand the long-term goals of uh, the district. What we've heard from people is there's like very few places to, to sit and uh, relax while, while they're in the neighborhood. We, we have tons of visitors, um, but no public space. They have four different streets that they're focused on, Prince Street being the first. I know that you've heard also people don't have a lot of places to sit in Soho. So this gives you a place to have a cup of coffee or sit and talk to your friends. But I think more importantly it says, you know, we want open streets. No, yeah, like this is a lot. I mean, it's a very busy street in general. I come to Soho all the time, so it's nice to like have like a nice public space to just kind of sit down. Yeah, as somebody that's lived in the neighborhood, we need something like this. I'm really looking forward to it being stayed. So we can all enjoy so the streets can... of Soho. Yeah. So come down and enjoy it with us. And wow. spend your money. <laughs> so these are fun. These are, you know, cheap and comfy seats that you can move around. So we expect people to be using them over the course of the day, moving them from circle to circle or pulling them up to the tables and chairs. That I love it and I love the color palette. Oh, the blue? The, the blue and the yellow. Oh. More streets like this? More <laughs> yes. streets? Yes, beautiful. I love it. So these fun little magnets that are going onto the tables and they are just a survey to share feedback from the public on what they think about these changes. We're getting ready to release a public realm vision plan that will make some other recommendations uh, for the broader uh, Soho Broadway district. We have a lot of buildings and a lot of people that come here so we have to be creative in finding uh, public spaces. So that was fun. It is a lot of fun. I mean it's um it was kind of insane for us to organize the release of this new vision plan that we've been working on for, you know, 10 months um, with the Soho Broadway initiative and align that with a demonstration project. But the opportunity was there to really showcase what's in the plan and the concepts and bring it to a much, much broader audience. You know, you can only reach so many people through a planning process and particularly during a pandemic, you know, we weren't able to get together with folks in the neighborhood uh, personally. So, it's been really valuable for us as a platform to you know, show, not just tell. And the response has been unbelievably positive as we predicted it would be because to Mark's point in the video, there just isn't space for people in this district. It's really overrun by, by cars, um, you know, despite it being one of those beautiful places to walk around in New York City. So you know, plazas like that and reusing streets is the opportunity. That is how we're going to enhance the public realm um, in this part of the city. So yeah, we're very excited about it. So what was really the driving force, uh, with this particular project? Well, I think it was certainly, um, the need for it was, or the opportunity for it was accelerated by the pandemic. You know, if you've ever walked those streets, you know, in lower Manhattan, you've walked through Soho, particularly along Broadway, which is the main quarter that the bid, um, oversees. Uh, you know, it's very uncomfortable, uh, particularly on the weekends or particularly at, at rush hour. There's a lot of through traffic driving west, trying to get to the Holland Tunnel. And there's a lot of traffic coming from the north, down Broadway, uh, also trying to access the tunnel. So between Broom Street and Broadway, there's some real serious quality of life and business impacts to, to the district as popular as it is. Um, and so the opportunity here was to kind of rethink all that, how the streets work, how transportation works, how the public space works, and to really set a framework and a vision for transforming Soho into a low traffic neighborhood. And um, we've been very lucky to have uh, you know, a client here that is, that is visionary, that actually sees this as being possible, sees the, the, the vision as being um, really important to the work that they want to do as a, as a small organization. There, there are three people plus a you know, a clean and safe team who's out there daily, you know, picking up the garbage and removing graffiti, et cetera. So they, they're, they're under resourced to take on this bold ambition, but I think they can, they can get there and this will hopefully create the impetus for that. Um, and, you know, we had great partners at the city of New York. We had people, you know, from the, the borough president, Gail Brewer, she was in that video. She's been tremendously supportive of this initiative. Um, the department of transportation has been very supportive of this initiative. You know, it's really going to fall on them to kind of take some of the, the big next steps, but um, I think we've set the table pretty well for it. Yeah. 
So uh, I pulled this this photo up. Is, is this also from that project? That is that project. And so, um, you know, from the hours of typically one to five or six o'clock on weekends, um, this is the scene that you'd have um, on Prince Street, um, Broadway even busier. And you can see that, um, you know, before this project was installed or when this project is not in place, all those people are on those tiny sidewalks left and right. And, you know, here in New York, we have a lot of construction all the time and scaffolding and old buildings that are being, you know, rehabilitated. So that pinches the space even more. So you can see this street is already oversubscribed. And as I, you know, have mentioned over social media in the last couple of weeks, you know, we counted in just one three hour period, we counted 9,000 people moving through this space, um, 9,000. And then on a whole day, this street averages 4,500 people driving. Um, you know, Broadway has seen 15,000 vehicles a day, um, many, many, many more times that um, in terms of people walking. So it's, it's obvious, right? It's obvious what needs to be done. Um, this was not a, this demonstration project is not a technically challenging one. We weren't concerned about people not showing up and using it. This is probably the easiest place to just lay out a little bit of color and some tables and chairs and have them instantly used. So um, it's been really great to get that response again from the community saying we, we want this. This is really needed. Fantastic. Um, you know, for the benefit of, of those folks who are uh, only listening in, uh, but even for, for those of us who have this video uh, visual, uh, can you walk us through the different elements? I think it's fairly self-evident, but maybe there's some things that I'm just missing in, in looking at this shot. Sure. I mean, we had a number of um, constraints with this project. Um, so the reason why this is now easier to do than ever in New York City is because of the pandemic. Um, we can get, apply and receive an open streets designation from the New York City Department of Transportation pretty easily. Um, but you know, we had to you know, find the line of best fit between what they're trying to achieve, which is consistency and impact over time of the program um, with the um, clients, you know, the bid, their resources, right? They're, again, they're three people. So um, we were not able to paint this street at this time. We weren't able to uh, make more interim changes yet. And so with that designation of the open street, they gave it to us for, at a minimum. They said, you could, you know, the, the, you, the fewest times you can do this is four times in a row on a weekend. And so we picked that just because of the lack of resources to manage and steward this space. We need to put those resources into play, which I can get to that later. We'll, we'll, we'll be done, but not yet. Right. Um, and then, so all those ma materials had to be 100% reversible, roll it up, you know, pack it away. In fact, um, we're storing it. I won't tell you exactly where these materials are stored, but in a very clever location on street, just not to give it away, but there's a very clever place where, um, you know, approximate to the site, we have this stuff stored and then we can roll it out and set it up. And so you've got your blue turf circles, you know, the blue is a color that we use throughout the actual vision plan and it's the color of the bids. So we want that kind of a visual consistency. You'll see the cones that were, you know, intending to separate the, the high levels of, of cycling traffic that come through this corridor. Um, you know, at peak hour, um, that doesn't happen, as you can see in this image. Um, but I would say that largely cyclists have been really amenable to the change and have, you know, behaved. And we've you know, witnessed a couple of people yelling at pedestrians. But for the most part, it reads as a public space. It makes sense why it's there. And people cycling tend to slow down and just take, as, take it as the space is, right? But those cones are meant to indicate, look, you know, there will be people cycling through here and create a little bit of a permeable, permeable barrier. Um, the tables and chairs are obviously what you see there and the umbrellas. Um, we really don't need umbrellas on this street. It actually doesn't get a lot of direct sunlight, but we really wanted a linear, you know, vertical visual pop right down the street. So as you walk through the intersection on the west or the east, you can look down the street and kind of see that, that line, that horizontality of the color, um, which, you know, it offsets from the blue really nicely. And then we want some more fun elements to draw in kids and families to use the street, literally sit on the street, you know, sit on the circles and, and use those uh, cushy yellow and um, orange seats, which are lightweight. Um, I found out this weekend when my son was with me that you can flip them over. They make really great drums. So, you know, kids have seen this space and know exactly what to do with it. They, they're the ones who start to jump from circle to circle or, slalom between them, making up games, you know, they know how to 
jump on top of or stand or roll, like they can roll their bellies over back and forth on those um, orange and yellow uh, uh, cushion seats. So it's, it's really nice. It's flexible. It's lightweight. It's fun and colorful. Um, it's, it's low cost. Um, so it's been really quite easy. And I'd say the things you don't see in the image is that we have created um, barricades at either end of the street that are your typical metal French barricade. And we then wrap those in sort of a mesh liner that um, is also branded with the circles and the blue and you know, named the project as being Little Prince Plaza. So that is meant to reinforce that this is a public space that you can come in and use it the way that you see fit um, and use that same materiality to create a large screen over the scaffolding. It's hard to see in this image from this vantage point, but there's that ugly scaffolding there. And so we dropped in a very large screen to kind of give the plaza a backdrop and hide some of the aesthetic, you know, uh, challenges that come with the scaffolding itself. So those are the main components. Um, pretty simple. It takes about an hour to set up and about a half hour to break down. Wow. Fantastic. Very fun. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 the, when I saw the video uh, of it the first time, I was just like, all right, Mike and I definitely got to talk about this. There's no doubt. <laughs> I'm very, very, very pleased with it. So, you know, it's, um, it's a moment in time, I'd say, in the last 18 months, really, since we talked last, where you know, we've gone from doing projects here and there in New York City, um, you know, I've largely been working all over for more than a decade, to really being able to align both you know, personal things like starting a family and then with the pandemic being you know, able to help organizations and collaborators here in the city pivot their streets and public spaces. Um, so it's been really um, exciting for me. It's been really edifying. And it's, you know, it's challenging work in New York um, with all the different layers of bureaucracy, but so much of that has been cut and reduced and people's minds open to the kinds of things that you know, we like to do in terms of delivering change and doing that quickly. So it's been, it's been quite exciting and I'm very, very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at, uh, not just in New York, but also in some of the other cities that, that you're working with, are you seeing that this is uh, becoming easier to, to have these discussions? It is. I mean, I mean, absolutely. From when we started doing this work, you know, in earnest, um, eight or nine years ago, um, you know, at that point, there were no RFPs calling for tactical urbanism, right? There was very few examples of communities doing this work, you know, with permission, with support, with staff from, you know, staff resources from cities. And, and now it's everywhere. You know, every, um, every corner of the globe, you see communities doing this type of work where they're figuring out how to get things going faster and then putting in the, uh, you know, the, the me putting the measures in place to be able to evaluate and pivot and, and then invest in, in future, you know, change. And that's, um, that's really exciting. You know, the city, not the city, sorry, the country of New Zealand has a program called the Innovating Streets Program, which um, it comes from the National Transport Agency called Waka Kotahi. Um, incredibly ambitious work. They, in one year, funded 70 plus projects around the country um, to make all sorts of changes to streets and public spaces. What's fascinating is that that program was in place, um, you know, before the pandemic or was about to be announced and launched before the pandemic. So really early 2020. And then the pandemic happened and they quickly pivoted the program and the reason behind the program to support the need for physical distancing on our streets and in our public spaces, which is amazing. And exactly the point is to be able to be that flexible to kind of think of this as a tool that can respond to something as terrible as a pandemic and, you know, in, in bad times, but also in good times, be a way to accelerate the change that cities need to, need to undertake, right? To um, offset climate change, to be more inclusive, to be safer um, and active. So yeah, it's been, it's been incredible in the last, you know, um, less than a decade to see that shift go from nobody asking for this work and us trying to beat that drum as loudly as we could to just being, you know, too busy <laughs> um, servicing the work that we, that we're doing now. So it's, it's, it's great. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I want to pull up another uh, video or another uh, image here that uh, that you shared with me. Um, I get get a sense that this is uh, a little bit about, about what you're talking about um, in, uh, you know, being able to, you know, 
codify and 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 have some tools available and and I guess that's right in the title there materials and, and tools and equipment library uh, talk a little bit about this program because I, I get the sense that this is exactly what you're alluding to exactly John so this is a very new project you know we also worked on this over the course of 2021 and this was just released last week um, with the Office of Planning in Washington DC and funded by um, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, which is you know the MPO um, for the Washington metropolitan area, right? So um, it was a resource that is really seen as the next important step for public space in Washington D.C. Um, you know they have done a lot of work around public life. Um, they've worked a lot with with you know Gail and and others to study public life, to bring activation to public spaces. I'd say really over the last seven or eight years. Um, and we've done a little bit of that work with them as well, but it really became a need to better uh, support local neighborhood groups and residents, um, you know, at the very small scale of the block, right? Just being able to provide the actual materials, the actual tools to, to move on, um, on projects in public space. And so, we defined the kind of typology uh, with them on the kinds of public spaces. We went through a lot of the different types of resources and the equipment and tools that are needed uh, for community members to do this work um, and really are trying to empower small groups rather than, you know, bids know how to do this work and larger advocacy organizations know how to do this work. Um, so this is, this is useful for them, but really this is for, um, for neighborhood residents and, you know, block associations and, under-resourced nonprofits and others who are doing good community work to get access to the things that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. So there's a very strong sort of equity component to this project. Um, and so the idea is that it lives now as this sort of digital library and resource, but the next step is to, to maybe even partner with the DC uh, public library system to start to embed these tools, uh, materials, and equipment uh, at libraries themselves or maybe at community rec centers where Anybody could check out the materials and uh, go use them and then bring them back. And that's kind of the next step and what's we're, what we're envisioning as part of this, this program. Fantastic. And I, I gave a quick little <laughs> snapshot of what the next thing I was going to ask you about was uh, it, it looks like you're uh, helping with uh, additional uh, active transportation plans and, and other types of uh, you know programs and initiatives like that. Yeah, and New Haven's been... Interesting, I'd say it's probably one of the only projects that we had here at the firm that really got put on pause for quite some time with the pandemic. Um, we actually started this work as a first phase back in 2019. And this is working with a, um, a CDC grant. So coming from the federal government that got uh, distributed to a nonprofit called CARE, which is really a, a healthcare organization and service providing organization in New Haven that works in the, what's been identified as the six most vulnerable neighborhoods around public health outcomes. And so they have, they're the recipient of this grant. Um, and so we've been working with them as well as the city of New Haven, who also threw in a lot of resources into this effort to create the city's first citywide active transportation plan. And we started, like I mentioned a minute ago, we started in 2019, we did six different demonstration projects or not really demonstrations, but pilot projects. And the idea there was Let's go work with volunteers out of these different communities, these, these six that are the most underserved in terms of safe streets and public space and public health outcomes. Let's get these projects in the ground quickly just as a showcase for what can be done, as well as a kind of lead in to the larger work that we've done now in phase two, which is this actual transportation plan. And this is a, you know, focused on cycling, walking, and um, making the bus experience better for all in the city. And so this has not yet been uh, formally released. We actually had a big public uh, meeting in a local park where we had a great turnout a couple weeks ago. And we were unveiling all the concepts and uh, a lot of the ideas that are in the plan, but the plan itself will be you know, released for public consumption as a draft uh, probably sometime in the next week or two. So we're, we're not quite there yet, but we're close. And um, you know, New Haven's one of these places where, you know, it's an older New England city. It's got a grid of streets. It's already very walkable. You've got, you know, 3% cycling mode share, which is not as high as we want it to be. But for U.S., it's a pretty good starting point for U.S. city. Um, high walking mode share. So, you know, we've got a lot of good things to work with in terms of the built environment that's there. And 
what really what this plan needs to do is get the political will behind it to start to really further invest in, in safer streets. And I think, I think we'll get there uh, pretty quickly with the city with a very supportive mayor and staff. Yeah, good stuff. It, it, it you know, older cities that are, uh, you know, scratching at trying to reclaim their streets and, and uh, to, you know, Victor was on last week and, and, and talked about, you know, Paris becoming Paris yet again, mm. you know, trying to reclaim uh, the fact that uh, until the automobile sort of took over, uh, you know, it, it was a completely different, you know, scenario. It was a completely different situation. And the same with these older U.S. cities. Uh, we're seeing that same type of, of struggle of, you know, whether you're talking Providence, Rhode Island or New Haven or, you know, it's like, you know, it, it's a situation where um, it, it's trying to come, you know, go back to the future and <laughs> go back to what, you know, uh, the, the, the built environment uh, used to be like or felt like in, in many ways. Um, now, you spent a fair amount of time in, in France this, this summer, correct? I did, yes. Talk a wonderful. little bit about that, because I, I think that you were probably a little bit like a kid in the candy store when you were in certain parts of, of, of the country, uh, given the fact uh, that you know Paris is really doubling down on making big changes. Um, I was there in 2015 documenting their very first Car Free Streets Day, and I know a lot has changed since then. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's such a phenomenal place, and you know, it's not just Paris, you know, that's doing this work in in France. Um, you know, as a couple other examples, we were um, on an island just off the um, the coast, uh, the the west coast of France this summer, and they it's an island where most of the landscape is um, salt. Uh, Farming actually, so they have all these irrigated saltwater pools that they uh, you know create salt out of, right? They harvest salt, and so there's these massive white mounds of salt in these pools throughout the whole center of this island. And there's these villages that kind of ring the outside of these wonderful beaches, and the entirety of the island is linked together with um, the cycle paths. So you can get everywhere on a bike, you know, from these villages, you know, and from beach to beach and, and town to town. It's really um, it's really quite amazing. So you know, there's things like that that you find in, in you know, France or you know, many other European contexts that really don't um, really haven't been stitched together in the way that, the, that we do it here in the U.S. yet, at least not at the scale that you see it there. Um, but I was so impressed with Bordeaux and the work that's been done there, the public spaces, the, the transit, um, the car-free spaces, um, the plazas, it, you know, and, and I learned while I was there that that work has been done largely in the last decade, that Bordeaux is not a place that you would think of for walking, cycling, or transit or, or public spaces, that it's really completely reinvented itself in the last um, decade. And so it's really inspiring to be in a place that, you know, is not Paris, right? This is a city of 250,000, so much more at that Providence, New Haven scale, right? Um, that in a decade's time could do what they've done. Um, so seeing that as an example, you know, that's not, um, that's not that context of Barcelona or London or Paris is really important, I think, um, in terms of learning about how smaller cities are doing this, this level of work. But of course, Paris has been, you know, um, you know, it's been so exciting to me for a long time, but I think in the last couple of years, the work that they've accelerated in their squares and public spaces, they've like, turned whole large intersections and you know auto dominated um roundabouts into squares like literal car free squares they've spent millions of dollars investing in that they've got all the cars kicked out of the the, the highways along the seine um, they're reducing the speed limits they're about to remove seventy thousand on street parking spaces to free up even more space they are already known for their cafe and street life right but now they've been doing a lot more of that in the curb lane as part of the pandemic and then the um uh, the Corona pieces, which are their, uh, their bikeway network. They had 50 kilometers of bike lanes that they created um, to fill in gaps in the network as, as part of their response to the pandemic. And I'd say the signature street there, Rue de Rivoli, which is really the, one of the major east-west streets that goes right along the Seine. It's right by the Louvre, right? So huge um, visibility, huge amount of foot traffic, huge amount of car traffic. They used to have 29,000 cars a day on the street. Um, 
and they've completely inverted the relationship um, of mobility and human beings on that corridor. So instead of having multiple lanes for buses and trucks and cars to share and a little slice of the street for pedestrians and cycling, they've inverted that so that there's only one little narrow single lane for buses and taxis. And then the whole rest of the street is basically a two-way bike lane and pedestrian space. And you know they now are seeing um, over 13,000 cyclists a day on that corridor where there used to be 29,000 cars. And that number just keeps on, on growing. And I think uh, when I talked about the three different kind of responses and where we are in this moment with the pandemic, they're on the side where you can see on the same street, the yellow markings and the yellow delineators and signage that they use for their Corona piece, their temporary bike lanes on the same street, you can see them you know, maintaining that for construction, but then the construction happening right next to it where the sidewalks are torn up and the permanent protected bike lanes are already being made on these corridors where they had infilled with this temporary network. And so they're transitioning that system already, you know, a year into their 18 months into that, into that program. So it's, it's, you know, it's happening there at such a scale and speed that I know it makes a lot of residents uncomfortable. <laughs> my, um, we go to France a lot because my wife is French and her father lives um, in Paris. So, you know, he's, he's somebody who has a very nuanced opinion about all these things, but we have lots of fun conversations and debates about the impact and, and what's good and what's not in terms of the street design. But, um, but the point is they're, they're doing it right They're They're ready, for, you know, getting themselves more ready for the climate emergency. And we need to see more big cities out there and small cities doing that work. Yeah. I had heard that, uh, that Bordeaux was, was, heading in that direction and really striving to to make a difference it's good to hear that uh that it, it seems like it accelerated uh even during the pandemic i've had a chance to make it to strasbourg and so i i, I you know and they of course are a little bit influenced because of their proximity to to germany and to and to the netherlands uh, but uh bordeaux was a little bit of a reach to try to to make it uh to when i was there in 2015 so it's good next to, time uh, next time yeah next next time for sure now um do you know what they did to really help uh activate the, the you know the infrastructure or was it you know just build it and and the pent up demand was really there i think it's a number of things i'm i'm certainly not an expert on on the history of what's what's transpired there over the last decade or so, but I was told one of the very first steps was to clean the facades of the buildings. So um, Bordeaux has, I think historically in the country been known as a little Paris because a lot of the architecture is very, very similar. And they have some kind of key major boulevards um, that are basically Paris, but two or three stories shorter in height. <laughs> so hence mini Paris. And all those facades were dirty, right? They were covered in um, and soot and they were covered in air pollution and particles and all the things that come out of tailpipes. And so there was a mayor, um, and I'm sure, you know, a majority of, of council supportive of just like really rethinking, look, we're not going to attract people here. I can attract investment. If the buildings look dingy, uh, we are dominated by cars and it's ruining the architecture of our city. And so they cleaned all the facades and spent a lot of resources on that and kind of unveiled this gleaming white city that people hadn't seen for decades. And then as part of that work, started to invest in a tram network um, to interconnect major destinations around the, the, the city and then investing in the public spaces. So they have, you know, really incredible, you know, old medieval center and many of those streets are either shared space or they're, uh, or they're car free. And um, all the plazas and squares are enlivened by great cafes and retail and restaurants, uh, everything being human scale and really just a lovely place to kind of walk from, from square to square. And then on their riverfront, they've invested tremendously on making this very long linear public space that um, includes one of the coolest fountains that I've ever seen, which is a you know, very long kind of big rectangle right at the center of the city on the waterfront and there's this very like thin, you know, layer of water. And then every 15 minutes or so, um, it, uh, you know, the water runs again, like it kind of slowly drains and then it runs again. And so it's something where like a kid, like, you know, my son, Luca, who at the time was six months old, you can have him just sit there in the summer in the, in the, um, um, in, in the fountain and it's perfectly appropriate for him, but there's, a whims whimsical nature to the space and a beauty to the space that someone who's an urban design aesthete like myself can really take pleasure in just taking it all in 
And it just attracts a huge diversity of people from around the city to go to that space, particularly on, on warm days, which was quite warm while we were there. So, um, you know, that thin layer of water as well reflects the historic architecture across the street. Um, uh, anyways, it's just, it's this really incredible um, linear space that we don't see a lot of waterfronts like that um, in the United States, particularly those that have emerged in the last um, decade as they've really transitioned from industrial use on the river to, um, to public realm, public space. What a great point though, too, of talking about uh, do the basic things first, clean the soot off of the buildings you know, from probably decades worth of automobile uh, exhaust and other types of smoke that uh, is, is polluting the city and, and exactly. the air itself. So start with the basics, give, give the city a good cleaning uh, before moving forward. Talk a little bit about the design of the the cycle network that is going in place. Um, what I'm looking for here is, uh, are they sort of following the, the Dutch model of the protected and separated? And then when there is shared space, we're looking at extremely low motor vehicle speeds. Uh, are you talking about Bordeaux or Paris? Or just uh, Bordeaux, yeah. I was thinking yeah. more of this, the, the, the smaller example. Uh, when I was in Paris, uh, there, they were already started with the the protected infrastructure and uh, and some of the the separated infrastructure, and I'm assuming that just got accelerated at, at even grander scale. Yeah, I and mean, maybe I can touch upon Paris in a minute, but Bordeaux has so many tiny streets in the city center that you don't see a lot of protected infrastructure because it's not it's not needed. You've got a lot of these streets that are shared space. They're you know maybe ten feet wide at most. No parking, right, in the city center. Everything's basically off street. So you get walking, you know, space, sidewalk space, and then you've got either a very low, low curb or no curb at all. Um, so cycling happens very naturally in those environments. Um, you know, I think what I'd heard from a few locals is that there's still some concern about the speed of cyclists in that environment. Um, but for the most part, that city center is shared in that manner. And then as you get a little bit further out, you're getting um, – you know, along the, the, the riverfront, for example, there's, um, there's kind of a two way, you know, network that's, that's emerged along the corridor, which is, you know, pretty common along waterfronts, right? It's kind of an unbroken space in terms of intersections. So the concerns you have with two way facilities doesn't really exist in that context. Um, and it links all the way down to a major new bridge, which crosses over to the other side of the river and a system that is basically like a riverfront trail that brings people on, you know, back to one of the city's main bridges the other direction. So they've got this nice center loop along the riverfront. It actually reminds me a little bit of what you see in, in your city in Austin, where they've really done a good job connecting the waterfront with paths. But then from there, it's a bit of a mix. You can see they've got some of the, you know, sharing of lanes, which doesn't really work very well. You've got some protected network that's one way. So directional, right, with the, the direction of, of travel for the most part where those facilities exist. Um, and then you've got a lot of like streets that are, um, that are major, they don't have that infrastructure yet. So I think the cycling has been, um, very, very popular and common in the core, but I think they've got work to do as they build out that network further to the, the edges of the city. And then on, uh, since, since we brought it up uh, on Paris, uh, right. the, the transformation <laughs> when I was there in 2015, I felt like the protected infrastructure was um, just okay. Um, having just been to, to, you know, spent a few days in Strasbourg, it, it was certainly nowhere near as advanced in terms of, of the comfort and the, the, the level of safety um, that, you, that you felt on the streets. But quite honestly, um, mostly it was just the, the, the streets and the boulevards where there were a lot of cars that was the biggest challenge. Yeah, well, Paris, Paris, as I've been explaining, so when I was there, I got to go on this really amazing three-hour bike tour to see all these changes um, with a colleague who works for what would be the equivalent of RPA. Right? It's, a, it's a regional think tank that does work uh, around the whole Paris metropolitan area, so not just the core city. And he's been a part of these changes for uh, quite some time. He had all this institutional knowledge, which was great. And he kind of walked me through and cycled me through three different generations of bikeways in the city. 
And a lot of it started with sharing bus lanes with um, and, and bike lanes. So basically that space was curbed and protected from moving cars. But as a cyclist, you were you know, still meant to share that with buses, right? Um, which is not super comfortable. If those buses are running with any frequency. Um, and then the sec- next generation really kind of moved to being on the sidewalk and carving space away from the sidewalk, which I think was also not ideal because um, not having any differentiation in, in height or enough differentiation in material, material, you just had a lot of conflicts that were emerging with pedestrians and the lanes themselves are quite narrow and not meant to handle the volume of cycling that's happening there now, which is again, been something that's completely exploded over the last 18 months. And so those lanes feel very uncomfortable now because they're not wide enough and you're squeezing a lot of things into a limited amount of real estate. And our third generation is directional for the most part. They are um, most often separated by some sort of curbing or barrier element that makes it much more clear that space is for cycling and the lanes themselves are wider. Um, I think there's concern that they're still not wide enough, but they're certainly wider than, than that second generation. And so being able to ride that and see the difference was key. Um, you know, Understanding how those facilities get resolved as they move through uh, squares and, and plazas, you know, is they basically they mostly drop away and you're meant to share that space and make sure that pedestrians have priority, at least that's the, the, the thinking or that's the hope. And, um, and then you're you know, still definitely seeing those challenges, John, at the intersections where all three generations come into these major junctions and they don't do a whole lot to protect cyclists um, you know, at the intersection. There's not enough you know, um, splitting of the, of the signals in terms of phasing for cyclists and pedestrians and there's no protected intersection. So you know, turning movements are a challenge and issue. And you know where those major boulevards cross each other, they're very, very large intersections. So you still very much feel exposed and you very much feel like you are impinging on pedestrian space um, at the intersections themselves. So there's still a lot of work to be done there, but they certainly have improved the design over the last decade uh, pretty pretty tremendously. Yeah, and I would say, uh, yeah, not wide enough, not wide enough. Uh, based on some of the videos that I'm seeing out of Paris right now, uh, it's, wow. I mean, it's it's amazing how how quickly uh, the numbers have, have come. Uh, so I hope that, you know, seeing th- that number of, of uh, you know, people riding bikes uh, out there, that'll really help them to try to figure out those intersections really fast. Yeah, I think that that will be, that's definitely the, the hope and goal, I think, of advocates and, and, you know, planners and whatnot. But at the trajectory they're going, they, you know, I, I kind of was more enamored with the Rue de Rivoli example, which was literally just give everyone the space, like the whole street, and then carve off a small segment for the cars. So there's a car lane, like there's a bike lane today on most of, you know, American streets, like that little sliver, and, you know, let them deal with that issue and let the, let the cyclists have, you know, pedestrians have more free reign of a much larger percentage of the street. If you do it that way, then you don't need as many issue, you know, uh, investments and changes in infrastructure at the intersections. You don't need as much physical protection. It just works a lot better and more smoothly in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to see cities try that strategy here in North America, like literally just take um, a couple east, west, north, south quarters that run through a city and just do it on one street, do it on one quarter or two quarters, right? And then feed into that system where you could have a total bike and pedestrian priority street that is you know, a major avenue or thoroughfare. And, and you will see, I think, tremendous gains in riding uh, if that were to be the case. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you're, you're completely you know, flipping the narrative here it, rather than just trying to create space for, for people who are not driving a motor vehicle. Uh, you, you're just you know, saying, no, 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 we're, we're, we're flipping this around. We're going to do what we can to maybe accommodate you if you happen to show up in a motor vehicle. But prim- the prioritization is definitely going to be people walking and biking. Yeah, it's the least expensive way to do it as well, you know, in terms of just thinking about, about budget. Um, and I know that that probably sounds radical to most Americans, you know, um, or North Americans. But if you think about almost every single street being not just accessible, but dominated by cars, it seems like we could start with a few different key corridors and connections where the cars are the guests, right? And we totally invert that relationship. So I'm, you know, I'm 
fascinated by that opportunity and that idea and that way to approach it. And it, it kind of takes this notion of a bike lane and, and kind of blows it up. It just becomes a bike street. You know, I think we've seen some of that in, in other European countries. They've, they've definitely played with that um, design typology, but it's hard to see that example in such a major car dominated corridor as the Rue de Rivoli once was, right? I mean, it's just so symbolic that, and they've, you know, it's really just uh, evaporated the traffic um, along along the Seine, right? Along the, in the very center of the city. Um, I forget the exact number, but they've seen a huge, you know, reduction in uh, VMT um, and, and car trips in the city center in Paris. And they're still happening. You still see cars. It's not, it's definitely not like this total nirvana when you're there, but um, it's so much different now than it was a decade ago and so much different than it was 18 months ago in terms of the number of people using, using the streets on, on bike. Yes, the great law of, uh, of traffic evaporation. It's like if you uh, build... Uh, full, full effect. The, full effect in Paris. <laughs> that's right. If you build uh, welcoming places for people to walk and bike and take transit and it becomes a little bit... Okay, let's be honest. If it becomes really a pain in the butt to, to drive, it, it's amazing how the traffic just evaporates. It goes away. I mean, it disappears. Our entire Soho Public Realm Vision Plan is based on that single principle that we will divert away, divert away, divert away, and eventually those numbers come down um, you know, a lot in conjunction, obviously, with, with a lot of other policies and tools that are at our disposal. But you know, we, we can build these low traffic environments if we want to, but we have to believe in that principle. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward into the rest of uh, 2021 and into 2022, what are you excited about? Um, I'm excited, I think, for the, the work that's been done in the last 18 months to really start to normalize itself. Um, you know, I think of it broader, you know, it's much more broader than just mobility, right? We've talked a lot about public spaces, but we haven't talked a lot about parks, right? I think parks have been such... Um, an underappreciated asset in the American community for so long. And uh, the pandemic shined a really bright light on park space. And I think, you know, here in New York city, um, you know, our park system is very underinvested in, and we're seeing massive, um, you know, calls for investment in that system. So I just think, you know, seeing resources marshaled politically behind, you know, this need that's been there all along, uh, but now having a lot more political will, I hope built, to invest in parks, in public spaces, in transit, um, hopefully it's going to be there. And I know that's a really, it's really patchy in the U.S. Um, and where that's being accelerated and where it's not, but it certainly is something that I'm excited about and the opportunity that, that's out there with the work that we do with the communities. Um, so that's exciting. And I'd say, you know, for us, we've got a lot of really um, exciting projects um, that are about to be implemented. We've worked on a lot of really exciting things in the last couple of years, but you know, I'd just say, you know, stay tuned for uh, a project in Culver City, which will be uh, implemented before the year is out. Um, major corridor overhaul and, and um, proposed to be one of three major corridor overhauls that put a lot of the principles we've been talking about today into practice. Um, so that's, that's going to be one that's fun to watch and fun to see how that progresses. Um, and then I'm excited about our team. You know, we've built a really great team at Street Plans. It's, you know, taken a decade to get, you know, the, the work um at the scale and the level of resources that we have now with our team and, and, and teaming. And that's, um, that's been really edifying. And, you know, we've got uh, just a great group here and I love working with them every day and just want to continue finding ways to, uh, for all of us to make an impact. That's what we, that's what we're all about. Good stuff. Now, when you, you say Culver city as in the Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's exciting. It is. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, starting, uh, let's see, the second week, I believe, in November, we'll be out there, almost our full team, installing um, a corridor redesign for cycling, for, for bus transit, and very large uh, curb extensions and, and murals that our team has designed uh, for, for, for the street. So it's kind of bringing all the things together that we work on oftentimes individually. You know, sometimes we're doing intersection redesigns or working on, you know, you know, pedestrian space, or sometimes we're working on the bike network piece. Sometimes we're working on making the bus, you know, work uh, better and be more comfortable. But this project has all those components in one. And yeah, and a very sort of supportive political environment to, to try these things. So it was born from the pandemic in a lot of ways, but also I think is, is going to far, um, uh, far outlast 
the sort of initial impetus for the work. And we're, we're almost there to get this thing installed. So we're excited. Good stuff. All right, let's let's uh, let's pull up one last photo and we'll sort of end where we started, which was uh, on some visuals of uh, the, the plazas that uh, that you've been working with. So I think that this is a this is another uh, a different uh, project and a different scene. So I'll uh, I'll pull this up and I'll have you uh, walk us through uh, what's going on here. So this is a neat overhead uh, that, that that's happening here. Uh, tell us about this one. Sure. So this is called Nomad Piazza. And this is another project here in New York City, also on Broadway, just further north from the Soho project. Um, and this is between 25th and 27th Street. And uh, the client here and collaborator was the uh, Flatiron uh, Business Improvement District. So they're called the Flatiron Partnership. And they oversee all the, the public spaces and streets in their district, which recently has doubled in size. And this was an opportunity that kind of came up um, very quickly as a collaboration. And so um, the, uh, the bid had been working, I believe, in a um, pro bono way with AIA, uh, so the American Institute of Architects chapter here in New York City, to develop some ideas and concepts for what's been called Nomad Piazza. And these two blocks have been open for dining um, and for public space as an open street uh, for the last year or more, I should say, uh, over a year. Um, but, you know, you had all the old striping on the street, still had cars parking on the street. It didn't feel like a plaza. And the, um, the Flatiron Partnership has invested and created some really wonderful spaces in around Madison Square that's completely um, transformed street space into public space. Um, largely to be car free, so to be shared space um, over the last uh, 10 years. And this is like the next, um, this is the next project to do exactly that. And they wanted to test it out for a month. Um, so this is what we call a seasonal street in New York City. It's when you can do this for a season and observe how it works and then take those learnings and then you know go to the next level. And I think that's really the goal here with the Piazza is to see the feedback that it gets to see how it works for businesses, for operations, for you know, pedestrians, how the cyclists share the space. And uh, the, the bid's been learning a lot, but largely from what I've heard, it's been a tremendous success. So we, we worked with them to help design what you see there, um, just the, the pattern, the paint, and then help them execute the project. And so we started talking about this project at the end of August, and then we installed it um, at the end of September. So it moved within a month. We went from, hey, would you like to help with this project to us all out there with, you know, blue paint on our shoes, um, you know, getting this, this one done. So uh, it's been a very, very uh, exciting project for us. Right on, right on Broadway, right in the, the heart of New York City. Good stuff. I, I had to laugh at the motorcycle that's in this photo. <laughs> right, well, that's actually, I think it's, a, it's an electric um, delivery bike. And so you see a lot of those. Yeah, you see a lot of those. And that's actually been one of the, the challenges with this project is that um, as it closed more and more of the, uh, the Broadway to through traffic, it gets a lot of not just southbound cycling, which is there's a you know protected bike lane all along Broadway through the you know, through this part of the city, but now it's getting a lot of northbound two-way cycling traffic. So there's a very strong desire line because of the way that Broadway works and the way the surrounding bike network works um, to have those northbound movements. And so uh, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this is that the cycling has to be better accommodated with those two-way movements, and to do that will be a little bit complicated because the um, the blocks are so short, you know, north south in this part of Manhattan. So you get a lot of intersections. And so really thinking through how to do that effectively on Broadway and not just here in Flatiron, but you know, further north through Herald Square, up to Times Square, up to you know Columbus Circle, at Central Park, like there's a real you know, down to Union Square, there's a real connection that can be made there. And and there's a huge amount of foot traffic, right? So how do we integrate cycling at high rates safely with space that's in very high demand for pedestrians. So it's going to be the coming, I think, conversation and, and, and challenge in terms of redesigning this more permanently. Right. Yeah. Any final thoughts that uh, you, you want to make sure to, to leave the audience with? Jeez, John, I don't know. That's a, <laughs> I've shared a lot of thoughts already. What are you excited about in the coming uh, year with the work that you're doing and advocating for? What are you seeing out there? You talked to you know, all these, these people are doing great things around the country and the world. So what are you seeing? 
You know, I think it's it, it's really a magnification of some of the, the, the things that we've just been talking about. And uh, as well as uh, one of the things that uh, Victor had mentioned last uh, last week in the episode was the fact that uh, some smaller incremental things are starting to, to take hold uh, and, and, and really, you know, that opportunity to do things quickly. Uh, so I think it's, it's a lot of what we talked about, you know, 18 months ago of, you know, can you do it lighter, quicker, cheaper? Can you try to uh, take down some of the barriers that are in place that, you know, within cities so that, uh, you know, there can be some flexibility, there can be some trialing, there can be some piloting. But then at the same time, I know that we need to move quickly on some big initiatives. And so I'm very, very excited to see the Parises of the world and the Barcelonas of the world that are making big, huge, bold steps as well. So it's that combination of, you know, the, the, the smaller stuff that's happening that is helping to create, I think, some momentum. Um, and, and then at the same time, seeing, you know, some bold leadership, you know, globally that, uh, you know, is taking place. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited at the direction that we're heading, but I'm also, you know, I feel that sense of urgency that we need to, to, to move forward with some, some, some big results. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think that's, that's exactly it. And what, where there needs to be a lot of work, um, Yes, making the small things and the quick things easier to do. Still, there's still a lot of work to be done there. And of course, you know, we've we focus on that for you know a decade plus now. But what I'm seeing, and I've seen this in the last couple of years, is there needs to be a much more intentional, you know, uh, pipeline that's established, a process that's established that looks at those incremental and temporary pilot projects and changes, and you know, backfills them with a process to make them permanent, creating the criteria creating the budgets and the you know, capital process to, you know, deliver transformation. We have literally no time to waste on these, on these projects. We, the super block, you know, proposal in Barcelona, like that's, it's amazing. It's setting the bar, but I think Barcelonans, you know, the, the politics there are such that they feel that urgency because it is urgent and we need more cities to feel that urgency and kind of build the system to, to make sure we're connecting the dots between, yeah, that was a great temporary one block plaza and we painted a couple times over 10 years and now we're thinking about redoing it to, hey, that was successful for nine months, you know, in two years time, that's gonna be completely rebuilt and will be car free space and further reducing emissions, creating more equity and, and access to open space and you know, creating a better environment for business, right? Like, we're not there yet. M many cities really struggle with that pipeline and making that connection and I think that's where a lot of work has to be done next. So yeah, I guess you asked for some parting thoughts that those are them. Good stuff. I love it, man. Hey, thank you so much, Mike, for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks, John. Great to talk to you. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 97 of the Active Towns podcast. I really hope you found this chat with Mike inspiring. I'm always amazed by the impressive projects and designs he and his fabulous team pull off and come up with. To learn more about his firm, Street Plans, and to access some of the fabulous visuals featured in this episode, be sure to check out the links in the show notes and, more importantly, over on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this week's episode, but first, it's time for my final weekly reminder and request to help me grow the culture of activity movement. Please consider making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word, and subscribing. Thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.